you hear the noise going on outside, and it just happened that they're working on this side of the building, but we're not going to complain. They're a little noisy. I did ask them if they wouldn't like to take lunch break between 12 and 1, so they're not drilling out here. But what's happening, if you don't know, is finally, after waiting two years, we're getting our exterior storm windows, which hopefully is going to make a big difference in our utility bills and how comfortable we are in here. And I think the ones they've done so far look really, really nice, so I'm really pleased with those. A um, couple of the bigger ones, they're not sure how they're going to do yet, so we're keeping our fingers crossed for those. But they promised me that they would either be gone from 12 to 1, or they'd move around to the back of the building, so I think we'll, I think we'll be fine. Um, don't have any cards to go around this time. Want to be sure everybody knows that for the Christmas holiday, we are going to be closed on Friday the 23rd, all the way through until January 3rd when we have our first brown bag lunch of the year. And I just have to say, I think it's, I think it's awesome because our last brown bag lunch of 2022 is going to be pardon me, very today. And our first brown bag lunch of 2023 is going to be soon made very than that when we open up again after Christmas. So I just think that's awesome. Brandon. I have a question. Question. Could you possibly get a car going for Mary Nika today? She's in uh, physical therapy during the Okay. And she's not doing well. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Thank you. Dixie, can we do that? Sure. Sure. Dixie's our car lady. That would be really nice. Maybe we can. She can find one, and we can get it going around while everybody's here. That would be really, really nice. And then just to so everybody knows, and I, I didn't think of this. Um, Sheila Goddard, who's been such a great member, and her mom. Um, we need a card for Sheila because her mom passed away. Lois. Thank you, Lois Sullivan. And uh, she was she came to Brown Bag Lunch often, and so we've lost Lois. So, our, our card. A, a sympathy <laughs> card. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So our Brown Bag Lunch for today, and I feel really badly I didn't let Dr. Mark DePue know that we were doing this program today, because I think he would have been very interested. We don't have a book, is that right? And so. Oh, some of his family members did. If you remember, he did our very first brown bag lunch when we started up again about his Civil War grandfather, whose name was George Sizer. George, it turns out, was the grandfather of the lady that we're talking about today. All right. So I wish I had invited him, but I didn't. I'd like to. I'd like to invite a guest that's got a close connection. My daughter-in-law, Kim Owen. I'll let her introduce her mother. Hi, um, Kim Sizer Owen. Actually, really, yeah, she would have been my great aunt, and this is my mother, Joan. Okay, well, welcome. I'm glad you came. I know I heard from Rich Rockmore that there was a connection there, but he didn't explain the connection. So I just texted my buddy Phil and said, and he said, I'll take care of it. <laughs> thank you. All right, all right. So, anyway, thank you. I think there's a just a, a great local interest in this crooked story. <laughs> what happened to our slide? Sorry, we're a little crooked today. <coughs> all right, so I think that's all the, all, the, all the information that we need. I just wanted to one more time thank everybody for all we did to help with our soup supper, our holiday soup supper and cookie walk that we had on last Tuesday, this past Tuesday. And uh, it was, a, even in spite of the not very nice weather, it was an awesome event. And so thank you all for, for coming, for baking cookies for us. And uh, we'll turn the time over to Barb Mayberry. And I'll try not to take her notes with me. <laughs> OK, can everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, some of you have already seen this program. I gave it a few years ago. But after Dr. DePue was here and we were doing all this research, some people got interested again. And we do have a copy of this book. Don Wetworth happened to find two of them many years ago in an antique store in Sabula, I believe, and he bought them for $5 a piece. I looked on eBay yesterday and the book is for sale for $143 and something. So somebody out there thinks they've got something. So anyway, in 1978, 
a mortician called an obituary to a newspaper in Illinois for an old woman who had died in a nursing home in Martin, Illinois. The editor of the Bloomington, Illinois Daily Paragraph said it was too sketchy and asked a reporter, Rick Beatty, Baker, to find out more about it. Contacting the mortician, Mr. Perry, he discovered that her name, Mary Dofour, was a name given to her by the state. Mary Doe four, because there were already three Mary Doe's in the institution, and no one had known who she was for over 50 years. He gave him the name of a therapist at the nursing home who had worked with her for a number of years but said she would not be able to give him a name yet anyhow. But he found that hard to believe, and he was able to locate Diana Strauss at her home. He explained that he was only trying to put together a four-paragraph obituary and just wanted her name, not a life story. Diana Stroud said, I don't think you can find out who she was. I tried for a long time and wasn't successful. And that's when she was alive. Maybe 50 years ago, we could have found out, but the damage was too severe by the time he got to know her. What damage? Uh, mental damage, Mrs. Stroud said. The mental damage of a sane woman being confined in insane asylums for decades. The mental damage of a normal woman being treated as if she were mad and being forced to live in barbaric conditions for the great bulk of her life. And I would like to read something that was posted a little bit later about this about what she went through in that institution. She was lined up with other residents of the institution and frequently given electric shock treatment. When the treatments knocked her out, she was tossed in a large tub of cold water that revived her. And finally, it said that uh, uh, at the la one of the last ones she was at, the formerly articulate, well-educated woman, adapted to her environment, defecated on the floor for lack of a toilet, washed herself in the toilet bowl when one was available, and blew her nose on the dress. But thus began Rick Baker's obsession with finding out the true identity of Mary Dofour and how she could have been locked up for 50 years. Mary Dofour's story began when she was discovered by police walking on Highway 30 near a Chicago suburb. She appeared to be in a daze with her clothing, clothing in disarray and told them that she had been beaten and raped and her purse stolen. The biggest problem she had was that she could not remember her own. She, um, she seemed to be articulate and intelligent. Hospitals at that time did not have to take patients if they could not afford to pay. Obviously, this young woman had no money. So the policeman took her to the insane asylum and she spent the next 50 years living a nightmare. Conditions at the Illinois Asylum for the Insane had deteriorated to such an extent that the state closed it down in 1973. The 600 remaining inmates were sent to other shelter home facilities that she did not know well, do well. She was transferred to Morton in 1975. By this time, she was shaking from being over tranquilized, nearly blind from untreated glaucoma, and had to be led around much of the time. She despised and was terrified of men, quite possibly a trauma from the original rape and no doubt, as an attractive young woman, from being uh, sexually assaulted by inmates and unscrupulous attendants during the times that she was there. Uh, she had, until she went completely blind, then a man could lead her around. Before that, she could not stand have a man around her. Diana Stroud probably broke the law by letting them, them see 
Mary's records at the nursing home. Among the things he learned was that Mary was pregnant when she was committed and gave birth to a child, but there were no records as to what happened to that child. Asylum records listed her as a housewife. An arbitrary birth date had been given to her because she needed one to get a social security card for public assistance. After long and gentle therapy sessions at the nursing home, Mary told that she had been a grade school teacher, but that she could never remember her name. Rick Baker became angry. He wrote a 14-page story about the woman and the horrors that she had endured and the editor said he would run it in the Sunday paper. The weekend editor buried it deep in the paper that Rick was sure no one had read it. The editor later apologized, saying that he didn't know it was anything important, so he just put it in with the ads in the back of the paper. Rick Baker changed jobs and was now working at the Peoria Journal Star. In January of 1979, the manager, managing editor asked him to update the story that he had included in his resume, the story of an old woman without a name. See if you can do something else with it, he said. So Rick revisited Mr. Perry, the funeral director, and found that the state had given him $300 for, dollars for Mary Dofor's funeral. But after hearing her miserable story, he used the money to buy flowers, hired an organist and a preacher, embalmed the body, <coughs> bought her a fancy dress, and laid her in a fancy expensive coffin. Four persons from the nursing home attended. Afterwards, the body was cremated and ashes put in an urn that resembled a coffee can. Rick redid his story, and it was run in the first two editions of the paper. This time, the AP called and was interested in putting it on the wire services. The Mary Doe 4 story was now not going to be read by hundreds of thousands, but by millions. He was just so sure that he was going to receive a reply to this story. A grand total of three letters were received. The first two merely commented on the story itself. The third was from a woman in eastern Iowa who had read the story in the Chicago Tribune. She said it reminded her of the story her mother had told her of a school teacher who disappeared one day and was never seen again. She thought her name was Alice Zeiser, and she had taught in Mount Vernon School District near Clinton, Iowa. He put the letter aside for a few days, and then finally making a phone call uh, to the editor of the to the letter writer, but she knew, knew nothing more. Then in the news, to the newspapers, who did not keep copies of those newspapers, but the Clinton Library did. All he had was an admittance date, which he was sure was not right. The accuracy of records on mental patients had been entirely suspect for decades. Diana Stroud had already told him that the date had been filled in the same as her birth date had been. The date he had, he had was December 2nd, 1932. The librarian agreed to look and called him back that afternoon to say she couldn't find anything. Asking if he had um, been, been correct about the town, he said the teacher was from Mount Vernon, a little suburb of Clinton. Much to his chagrin, he discovered that Mount Vernon was 60 miles. The library told him to contact the library at Cornell College. Calling the library, he found they would not do research for him, so he called the Mount Vernon School District and asked if she knew of any Mount Vernon school teacher who had ever disappeared about 50 years previously. The request led him to Harris, Harry Sizer in Lisbon, Iowa, and then he learned the story of the Earl Sizer's life. Merle, as she was known, was the oldest child of W.R. and Anna Sizer. Born in Clinton, Iowa, the family later moved to Britt, where his father was a tenant farmer. <clears throat> Raised the children in a strict Methodist household, Merle was a bright child and memorized Bible verses long before she entered school. W.R. was not happy when he discovered no Bible would be taught when he delivered her for her first day. 
Merle finished school and began teaching at a small country school. She was determined to go to college and saved almost all of her earnings from teaching and at age 22 had enough money to pay for a little more than a year at Cornell College. She had never told her parents about her dream, but when she did, her father immediately decided the whole family would move to Mount Vernon with her. He uh, said good tenant farmers were needed everywhere and Merle could live with them. In 1920, he packed up their belongings and made the trip to Mount Vernon, over 100 miles away. Although times were bad, he landed a job as a tenant farmer for Walter Penn, a wealthy dairy and feed farmer on the outskirts of Mount Vernon. The day after settling into their new tenant farm, a young, good-looking man arrived with two bushels of apples. They would get three apples, beef, milk, and butter as tenants of Walter Penn. This was Merle's first encounter with Walter Penn's son, George. She learned he had served in the Army during World War I and would also be attending college at Alberta. The two became inseparable over the summer. And after the school began, they met as often as they could between classes. W.R. was happy to put them as a couple. After all, he was a good Methodist and going to a college that had common sense enough to teach Bible in the curriculum. The fall of the 1921-22 school year was the last semester before her money ran out. She refused to borrow money even though George said his father would loan it to her interest-free. George said his father could be pay, should be paying Merle's father more, and she wouldn't have to borrow money. When Merle said her father was paid quite well, George said, B.S. My father has never paid anyone quite well. He's a greedy SOB. Merle was pretty shocked to hear anybody talk about their father now. <coughs> After a year and a half of teaching at Springville, Iowa, in the fall of 1923, she again attended Cornell until she ran out of money again. She was now 26 years old. Her father's sister, Alice Sizer, a principal at the First Ward School, arranged for her to teach second and third grade at the Fourth Ward School in the Coconut in the fall of 1924. <clears throat> George didn't want her to go. He asked her to marry him. She said if they got married, they needed one to finish college and she was to finish. She lived for the nearly daily dating letters that she received from George, keeping them all in a small black case under her bed. Every Friday, she withdrew $10 from her bank and took the train to Mount Vernon and her parents' home so that she could spend as much time as possible with George. In the summer, she again attended classes at Mount Vernon, spending all the free time with George. In the school year of 1925-26, to 26, was spent basically the same as the previous year, rushing home after school to read George's letters and placing them in the black box under the table. Shortly before the end of the school year, George's sister, Bess, asked Merle to go to the University of Colorado in Boulder for the summer session. Merle had never been out of Iowa and thought this would probably be the last chance to do this because she'd probably be spending every other summer with George for the rest of her life, so she decided to go. After almost nine weeks in classes, she couldn't stay away any longer. Leaving Bess in Colorado, she boarded a train for home. She hired a cab at the train station and had the driver drop her off at Walter Penn's house, sending her luggage on to her parents' home. At 28, Merle Sizer was finished walking down the yellow bit road, Rip Rip Road of Life, and standing at Walter Penn's front door was about to enter the The result of this visit is it's conjecture. Nobody really knows. But a top law lawman theorized later that Walter Penn took sexual advantage of the world. This was 
based on the fact that you pretty much know it's an organizer and that had been accused of the same before, and partly because the last person he tried to take advantage of was Merle's younger sister. The sister told this to the detective long after Merle had disappeared, after getting his promise to never tell him about it. She thought it would kill him. The world changed drastically after that visit. She could have stayed in Mount Vernon for another month, but she went back to Macomb immediately and wrote a letter to George, breaking off their relationship. George tried to see her, but was denied entrance to her aunt's home. She threw his letters away. She no longer went to Mount Vernon every weekend. She stayed in her bedroom. Several weeks after the school year started, Merle was home in bed for two weeks. By the end of September, two months after returning to Colorado, Merle called George and asked him to meet her on the college campus. She had told him that she was pregnant, and he happily said he'd marry her. But when she told him she was only two months pregnant, he knew it wasn't his. Merle told him she despised the father and wanted an abortion. No amount of pleading on George's part that he should raise the baby as his own. In the middle of October, she went to a doctor in Mount Vernon. The doctor refused to perform an abortion and spent an hour with her trying to get her to change her mind and giving her options. However, all the options would require money and she was adamant that her father should never go about this. On November, 24, on November 4th, 1926, Merle had taught school all day and was scheduled to teach the next day. However, neighbors later reported that Merle had been at Walter Penn's home that evening and that they had heard Merle and Walter yelling at each other and it's not known if there was anyone else in the house at the time. At noon on Friday, November 5th, 1926, Merle had lunch with her good friend and co-teacher Vera Griffin in a local cafe. Several days before, she had given Vera a note telling her how much she had valued her friendship. Vera kept the note in a little vase on a shelf and 50 years later showed it to Ripley. Vera finished her lunch and went back to school. Merle went to the bank, withdrew $10, and also went back to finish the school day. Aunt Alice had been called away for a death family and she was not there when Merle packed her bag and boarded the 6 p.m. train for Mount Vernon. At Baldwin, another teacher, Catherine Turner, boarded the train. Sitting by Merle, she tried to make conversation. Although reluctant, she did say that she was going to Cedar Rapids to see a doctor. On Monday, Merle didn't show up for school. And upon discovering the students in the Below, Principal Vera Griffin called Aunt Alice. Alice had only returned late Sunday afternoon and Merle hadn't been home. Alice contacted W.R. and Anna on Monday night and learned that Merle had not spent the weekend with them either, and the search for Anna Merle Sizer began. Merle was described as a little taller than most women of the day, but only weighing about 100 pounds. She had a fair complexion, blue eyes, dark curly hair, a substantial dimple in her chin, and small dimples at her cheeks when she smiled and had a larger than average smallpox vaccination on her left arm. <laughs> Newspapers across eastern Iowa covered the story well. Her picture was run in papers and updates on what little progress was being made was reported often. Reports of a woman matching her description and seeming to be in the days along the Lincoln Highway were received, but nothing came of them. The Mount Vernon doctor finally came forward and told W.R. that Merle had been pregnant. George and his father were questioned extensively. A doctor at Oxford Junction was questioned regarding having tried to perform an abortion. Lead after lead turned into dead ends. Perhaps if those two two policemen in Illinois had made a different decision, the story would have been a different ending. Anna and W.R. Sizer both died believing their daughter was dead 
perhaps murdered by either George or Walter Penn. Rick Baker continued trying to search out the possible uh, connection of Merle Sizer and Mary Dunbar. He eventually found a picture of Mary that had been taken by a professional photographer not too long before she died. And she, he wanted to have them compared forensically, but he needed x-rays of the skull. There was no DNA at that time. And of course she had been cremated, so there was nothing to go over there. Um, he interviewed people at the many institutions she had been a patient at, and there had been a picture in one of the early institutions, but it had been burned 10 years after she had been moved to another one. His biggest obstacle was the date that Mary Dofour was admitted, 1932. He finally discovered that was the date she entered a specific institution. There were so many Mary Doe's that several were given the same birth date at place of birth. As detailed records were sealed and could only be captured with the, uh, from having a family member uh, file a court order, he tried to talk to the family. At first, to Harry Sizer, her brother, refused. He thought, you know, mom and dad figured they had this figured out and they didn't have to have that done. But finally, he was convinced. And so they filed papers with the state of Illinois. And the state of Illinois kept putting back, you know, they would miss court dates and all this stuff. And it was assumed that the state was afraid that if they found out they had actually abused this woman and they knew who she was, that a lawsuit might be filed. That Harry Sizer was an old man by this time. And I think they thought maybe he'd die before they get these records over. But um, several days after the court finally got tired of the state of Illinois putting them off, they granted the okay that the papers could be opened. And a few days later, Rick received a phone call. Harry Sizer had died. But his son, Bud, decided he was going to carry on with this. So eventually, they all, the uh, family members and Rick, traveled to the Mental Health Institute in Peoria to look at Mary's files. There were a jumbled mess. At least two patients, information was in it. No dates, nothing that would help at all. Later that day, later, uh, the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation file on the case was open, and Rick was able to read it. In this file was a description of Merle provided by her parents that Rick Baker had never seen before. Under birthmark, light discoloration on the bridge of the nose. Looking at the picture of Mary Dufour, taken by a professional photographer in the asylum, knowing where to work, look, the mark is obvious. It's a little hard to see here, but there, I could see we're in a photo, if you saw the actual picture, this lighter across the bridge of the nose was there. He was sure they were the same person. And so he, he felt in his heart that he had made the connection that these two people were the same. And when this picture was taken, she had had a stroke, and therefore her face was pulled down on one side. But you know, you kind of look at the eyebrows, the curly wavy hair. I mean, I can see where you went. And the dimple in the chin. Okay, now a little bit more. In the fall of 1926, George Penn started teaching at Niles, Iowa. In the spring of 27, George Penn married Cornelia Burnell in Niles, Iowa. In 1937, George Penn called authorities at Mount Vernon to come to the house. He was sitting at the kitchen table with a gun in his hand. He said his father, Walter, was dead in the basement. George said he found me there and brought the gun upstairs. Walter left no suicide note, 
George was never accused of having anything to do with his father's death. But a, a Lynn County Sheriff said he had no proof, but was sure that Walter's death had something to do with the disappearance of Earl 10 years ago. Um, the Sizer family uh, is buried in the Miles, Iowa Cemetery, and they, believing that Merle was dead, they had put up a, 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 a memorial stone for her. And even though Bud <laughs> Sizer thought they probably had found her, he was a little hesitant to have any ashes dug up because probably like the county home, they weren't sure exactly where they had buried her ashes. And he didn't want to bring somebody else's ashes back home to be buried. So they left her where she was. Uh, this was George Maya <coughs> when he started as a science teacher in the Coconut Isles. I can remember um, when this book first came out, uh, Vivian Rowe and a few people of that age were talking about it. They wanted to get a hold of this book because they, they had had George Penn as a teacher in high school. And that's another Exodus picture of him. But then tragedy came. The Rick Baker's manuscript was done but he hadn't seen and done anything about having it published yet. When he was killed in a auto crash, and I-74 in uh, 1988, I think. Yeah, I got it. Okay, in March of 1988. But he had worked with another journalist a little bit toward the end of this, so his wife asked him, to finish the manuscript and have it published, and they did. Uh, I think that uh, Helen, can tell you, Helen and Richard, after they heard this story the first time, said that we were really lucky to have a copy of this book mm -hmm. because all around Mount Vernon, any time that book might show up, it suddenly disappeared, whether it was in a library, at an auction, or whatever. And the feeling was that the Penn family so hated that book that they tried to get rid of it every time they could. So, anyway, uh, um, the story, I guess you could say, you can believe it or not believe it. I think he made a pretty compelling case for the book. So, anyway, that's the end of American War. <laughs>
haven't read it now, so they're kind of intrigued by it too. It's, a, it's the genealogy library. <laughs> and how much did you say it was for sale? It was for sale for $143 and some cents. $143. All right, the manuscript was done, but he got killed in this auto accident. So she got a, another journalist friend of his. There's just a little bit in the back that he goes on, you know, tells about it. But then he had the, he finished it up. So Rick Baker. Yeah. So Rick Baker actually did write it. Yeah, you did outstanding. That's, I've never heard the story. Mm -hmm. I have never heard anything about it. And then, Barb, was it was it not George Sizer on the tombstone with Mary? Yes, the, that was our Civil War. The, at, in the Miles Cemetery, the big stone had the George Sizer on it. That was her grandfather, and her parents' names, I think, are, excuse me, are on there too. But her parents just put that little memorial one up because they were just sure she was dead. And then George Sizer was the Civil War soldier that came back and settled in Miles, raised his family there, that our first brown bag lunch was about in September that Dr. Mark DePue came and got. And it was letters that he had written home to his sweetheart. And that was her grandfather. What makes the book so expensive? Mm. I, don't, I mean, you can ask it whether you get it or not, I don't know. I think it's just because so it's kind of a rare book. Yeah. I mean, there's not that many copies. I, I, I don't know how many copies he, if they kind of self-published it, uh, they probably didn't make a whole lot of copies originally. Yeah. Does Walt, did Walter have a wife that was ever, does she know about him and the womanizing, and where was she doing some This, the father? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I don't know. And then when he was found dead, it was at his son's house? It was at his, his oh, father's right. home. He had gone there and found him. And there was some talk that they had heard them arguing the day before. But the authorities, but at least one of them, felt sure there was some connection. Like he had to attack the Did he kill himself? Did <laughs> George do it? Yeah. <clears throat> who knows? The son knew what he did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there was something in there too that the Oxford Junction doctor went to prison well, for I think that was just maybe a lead they got and that he, he had never really she had never really been there. That was just one so of the people did that go they to prison for Well you probably Yeah the doctor did run that go prison for, um, for uh, illegal abortion so that doctor but he didn't he didn't perform hers but back then he did go to prison and he was an Oxford <coughs> Junction. I can't remember the name and stuff. <laughs> Doug, Barbara wanted to know if you were involved in any of that newspaper. Did you remember that? that? When it was no, I don't recall okay. that. Is there a date on the? Uh, I think it was 80, 79, 1988. 79, it looks like. 79. Uh, that I think that was after he first published that article. Mm -hmm. That, um, you know, he was trying to find out something <coughs> about her. So. Yeah. I think Lowell Carlson was uh, at the newspaper at that time. I haven't moved okay. back in the period. Right. Oh, right. Any story. Other? I have a few memories of uh, Sarah Griffin. Oh, uh, me too. Very wonderful teacher at, at yeah. the Fourth Ward School. Right. Anything else? Richard. I don't think it's sort of similar to the story. Uh, how he and Dad's relatives, how Klein and Dylan found the pearl, and the Dylan's pearl from the huge Iowa City. Now, yeah, this, this one guy, you can't find any records of him from the Newberry Library in Chicago. Yeah. Lots and lots of people have disappeared over time and never, never found a trace of it. And I think one other thing that really complicated that, this was in the late 20s, and then the depression hit. Mm -hmm. Right. And everything got lost at the shuffle from the depression. You mentioned but, but it makes you wonder why on earth those policemen didn't follow through and do something afterwards. There was a weekend and they wanted to get home. They just dropped her off at the museum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And she never six. left. And they called Mary Bill for him because there was three other Mary Bills. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they had, they didn't have facilities in the in the jail for women. Right. And so that's why they took them to the mountains. And, and even in Jackson County, or all counties that had poor farms, mm -hmm. so often people were just, they didn't want to deal with them or they didn't, couldn't deal, they were just taken to the poor farm and then just started down this road of, there was somebody in the right. that wrote a book and had something about the lady that was in a mental institution. I don't think I heard your question. She said, was there another book where there was a mention of a lady in a mental I'm institution? Sure from a yeah, a Makokata book of some sort besides Does anyone this. know of another case like this from Makokata? No. Where someone disappeared and they were... Maybe it was this one. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you, Barbara. That was a wonderful job. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Don't forget our Tuesday brown bag lunch, the first one in 2023, will be Sue Mayberry. And she's going to be talking about the history of the appliance businesses around the county, right? The whole Pretty county. Much the whole county. Uh huh. Which is, you know, how much fun we had with the old grocery stores and the old gas stations and filling stations? Sue's going to do appliance stores. Everybody had to have that refrigerator. <laughs> washer or whatever, so it should be it should be a lot of fun. It's going to be a lot more oh. than I expected the time. Yeah. All right, that's awesome. Yeah. So that would be a great program. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Enjoy your holiday season. Merry Christmas to everyone, and Happy New Year, and we'll see you soon. We hope. Thanks.